Hi, I'm Emma. And I'm Helena, and we both work at the MS Trust. Just a little disclaimer, the interview in this podcast was recorded on Zoom, so apologies if some is iffy at any stage. You know all this by now. <laughs> Please do bear with us. We'd like to welcome you to our podcast, Multiple Sclerosis, Breaking It Down, and to this episode where we'll be t- talking about sex and MS, and in particular, sexual problems for women or those with female sexual organs who live with MS. But don't worry, because our next podcast will be looking at sexual problems in men or those with male sexual organs who live with MS. So if this episode isn't quite right for you, the next one might be. At the MS Trust, we know that talking about sex and sexual health isn't easy. Many people can find it an awkward or embarrassing topic to discuss, whether that's with partners or your health professional. That's why we've invited subject experts Denise Middleton and Leslie Catterall along to answer some of the questions that you may have wanted to know the answers to, but have always been a little bit too nervous to ask. But before that, though, let's hear from Roxy, a.k.a. Malpus Rose's fashionista, about their experience of sex as someone living with MS, uh, as well as some tips for other people. Today, we're really lucky to be joined by Roxy, a.k.a. Multiple Sclerosis Fashionista, um, to talk about the topic of sex and MS. Um, hi, Roxy. Do you want to just start off by introducing yourself a little bit, please? Yeah, absolutely. Hi, Emma. Um so for people that don't know me, my name is Roxy Murray. I um, also go by the Multiple Sources Fashionista on Instagram and Roxy MS Advocate on Twitter. I am a disability and MS advocate and podcaster. Um, I advocate for people with MS to get better treatment and better drugs and for all people with disabilities to have better disability rights. Um, I have relapse and remitting MS. I'm currently 34 I use fashion as a tool in my activism um, because fashion is something that I did before I got MS and it's something that I like to keep in my life in the present. And then other than that, um, I'm here because I can't stop talking about sex and MS because I think it's a subject that people don't you know, talk about enough and I think it affects all of us. So I'm happy to be here. So thank you for having me. Um, obviously, a little while ago, you wrote a personal story blog for the MS Trust about your MS diagnosis journey. For anyone who's not managed to read that just yet, are you able to tell us like a brief overview of your diagnosis? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I first presented with what I now know as MS symptoms when I was 18. I woke up, I had blindness in my right eye, double vision in my left eye. And I was rushed to a eye hospital, Western Eye Hospital. They did some tests. They thought possibly I would have had a brain tumour. So they rushed me to another hospital to have a lot of scans and stuff. Um, there was a lot of testing and stuff. They gave me stories to bring it back, which thankfully it did. Um, and I had to go back and forth to different neurologists. And they decided at that point I had lupus, antiphospholipid syndrome which is like a blood disorder and benign intracranial hypertension, which means for anyone who doesn't know, the spinal fluid in my spine rises too quickly to the brain barrier. And then it means that it creates swelling in my brain. So that's what they thought I had. Um, fast forward a few years, like six, eight years later, we realized that's not what I have. Um, and previously though, when, before they gave me the diagnosis, they had, they had suspected MS as an option, but they decided because I was brown, even though my mum is actually white, that, um, you know, it's not possible for someone of your skin tone to present with MS because it's just not atypical. Um, I'm 34 now, just for everyone to know. So that was a few years ago. We have progressed, thankfully, but I'll carry on. Um, so about eight years later, I was at work. I couldn't put my hands above my head to put clothing on a store shelf. And um, because my manager at the time knew there was like, you know, I had lupus or suspected lupus and stuff. She was like, this is not right. Go to the doctors or the hospital, should I say. And it's OK. And get this, you know, let them to look at you because you don't seem OK. I got to the hospital. Um, as soon as the neurologist there is a whole new hospital than I'm used to. I was in Kent, but I live in London. So thankfully I went to Kent that weekend and ended up in the Kent Hospital the woman went to me you've had a stroke and I was like a stroke I did it's just like your side of your face has dropped and I was like I couldn't see that in my own face so imagine that like sometimes you have a mini stroke but you can't see it she was like do you mind because I'm looking at your notes for me to retest you because I don't believe that you have lupus like everything you're saying to me your history of like passing out wetting yourself 
having intense anxiety all this doesn't seem like lupus at all um and I was like mm, I don't know because previously I was having therapeutic lumbar punches now if you know what a lumbar puncher is that's a spinal tap it's like a massive needle in your back to collect spinal fluid to drain for the benign to hypertension and I had loads of hospital trauma from that um I was like, mm. she was like, well, I can sedate you, which is the first time anyone's ever offered me that. And I was like, okay, on that basis, okay, as long as this is the last time and we get some answers. So she did it. Um, she actually was the first person to test my oliconal band. So taking the spinal fluid out, so they've thrown it down a drain. She sent it to a lab for it to get tested, which is wild thinking about how many I've had. And then she actually done another MRI. The thing with my previous MRI when I was first um onboarded with the lupus and stuff they done the mra but they only done one of my brain she did one with a slightly bit more of a room visual field and um she caught lesions on the top of my spinal cord um and she was like no with that and the other kind of band she was like you have ms um which was great i was like oh this sounds like as she told me a bit about it, I was like, this sounds right. Like it, my mobility, how I feel, the depression, anxiety, all the symptoms I'm having, the double vision, um, sounds like MS. But then I had to present that to my actual neurologist who was like, don't think we're convinced though. And then that was a whole other story. And that's why I sit in front of everyone now as an advocate, because that sent me on a journey of having to advocate for myself. Like I actually agree with them and I don't agree with you and I would appreciate if you actually you know on board and help with certain drugs and stuff and we're there now but it was a whole other like a few years journey and as anyone that has MS knows having aggressive prompt treatment is optimal so now my mobility is a bit more compromised based on that but yeah that's just an overview of me but there's so much more that must have been pretty tough, like being pulled in almost opposite directions by different health professionals saying, oh, no, it's this thing. Oh, no, I think it's this thing. And you're kind of like, well, where, which way do I go? How does it work? Absolutely. It was it definitely like I had to take a two year break in hospital. So like I got that. And because I had a new MS diagnosis and then they tried to put me on Tysabri, but it didn't really work. And then I became JC virus positive. I too was going for like a weird depression. I think just from not being listened to all the prod and proc and all the spinal taps, the not being listened to, the not really understanding how to advocate at a hospital appointment because it's just it's not the easiest thing, especially when people speak medical jargon. And I had to go away for two years, reset myself. So I came off all my antidepressants because I was taking too many and they were interacting with each other. So I kind of lost my own personality. I had to change my diet, just how I thought about life and how I lived it. Um, and then I learned to advocate. I learned how to speak their language so that when I went to a hospital appointment, I wasn't sitting there waiting for them to help me. Like I wasn't waiting for them to go to me, which, you know, this, this and this. I was going, well, actually, no, I've heard of this drug. I want this treatment. I know this person. I need to go here. Um, and that changed my trajectory of how my MS has been dealt with going forward because of like you said like the feelings I've had from just being told no or go over to this person that person saying no and just yeah just not listening to you basically evidently as we mentioned earlier the podcast is going to be all about sex and MS what was your sex life like before your diagnosis and have you noticed that that sort of shifted after everything went on and you eventually received that news Yes. And um, no, it's weird because obviously I'm queer. So I'm quite sex positive anyways, just because I think as a community, we almost have to be because everyone discusses our sex, our sexual health or, you know, our sexual status for us. So you have to kind of learn how to do that yourself. So I was very active, you know, I was young and, you know, living life and exploring life. Great. But then as time had gone on, I'd realised that like my hypersensitivity had changed, how sex felt had changed how my how like I wanted to or not do it so like fatigue the certain things that symptom wise that were affecting how I could express myself sexually and also just on the basis without intercourse and stuff did I feel sexy 
was like a massive thing from being so tired could I get ready to make, put myself in that zone because sex is mental as well as it's physical to feel empowered enough to want to do that what were some of the sort of symptoms that you did find other than the fatigue sort of affected your sex life we had the hypersensitivity which meant that if someone touched me I'd literally vibrate so like intensely that having an orgasm or having like sexual pleasure became like you was getting like a, if you've been into like a not like a fun house and you sit on the electric shock thing it felt like that which in theory some people sound amazing but it's a weird thing when you're like having sex and your legs going like like this and you can't control it and you're like it can go from pleasure to pain quite quickly and then also there's the under sensitivity and just the lack of desire because depending on how active my ms is and what lesions are like you know pumping off on that day I might just not feel into it. I might not feel connected in my body. And then sometimes I just can't feel anything. So like, say you have sex and in the first 10 minutes you feel sensations like getting into it with four plates or great and everything. I'm not feeling that, like I'm feeling nothing. So you have to put your brain sometimes either in a place of pleasure for the other person. And then my, I realized that my body would then eventually relax. It was like, it was almost too uptight. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like uptight mm -hmm. in the process so that it wouldn't like loosen into the moment. So I've had to learn kind of navigation in that sense. Um, and like just spasticity, stuff like that, which all kind of links to the over hypersensitivity. When you say, sorry, just going back to the previous thing. So obviously you talked about being like your term of sex positive. For people who don't really know what that means, how would you describe sex positivity? Oh, that's a good question. So sex positivity for me is someone that is very into sex. <laughs> that's what that's to me. It's like, you know, I um, had a, I have like body dysmorphia. So I have this thing about my body, but I've had to learn how to, you know, appreciate it in a certain sense. And I've done that through probably just culture and fashion. Like fashion is very hypersexual, especially the fashion I love from like the 80s, Alexandra McQueen, the Vivian Westwood moments. They're very, and I would on board into that. I loved like Euro trash as a kid. I'd be the person like watching stuff and like, oh my God, look at the swingers swinging or the nudists on the beach. I, I love that. So I was always quite curious. So sexual activity means that I always lean towards it. I want to know more, even if it's not for me, it might not be my kink. It may be the thing I want to do. But I want to know about it because I'm just that curious. And then, you know, I'm open. So like I'm pansexual, like, you know, I love people. I'm not like it's not specific gender or specific agenda. It's just, you know, I'm open. And I find that sex positivity is not just sex. It's everything else around that. And I suppose for me, part of my sex positivity is clothes and fashion because the right clothes and fashion makes me feel sexy and makes me want to engage. So it's just about positive thinking in the realm of sex. And then plus, I'm all about toys and I'm the first person to be like, here's this toy, use it this way, it will help you. And I think it's just about being open to the idea of sex, no matter how it comes on board. So it could be sex with yourself, with a partner, partners, and with toys, or just like you know, exploring your own body with like tantric massage and stuff like that. I think that's a really important point to bring up actually, is sometimes people think of sex and they literally think of like the end intercourse version of sex, but actually it can be so much more and it can be so many different things. Yeah, I find it's actually more pleasurable before then it is like obviously yeah everyone likes penetration no matter like what it's great but there's so much more before there's so much like so much more intimate with yourself with the people around you which I think means that the climax or end result is always better because you've shown someone love so especially when you have MS and like you kind of have those disconnection moments in your body where you probably might not like I went through a place where I was like my body's like basically betrayed me what do I do and I had like this anger towards it and when you have someone else or yourself exploring your body and loving other parts of your body that you don't love it might be the fact you can't walk but someone still kisses your legs it might be that you feel plus size and you're like I'm you know my and someone kisses your stomach there's something about that that you know when someone loves the parts of you that maybe you're kind of not connected to how empowering that can be and how that can transform how you feel about yourself so yeah it's I don't know it's important to me
When you were first diagnosed, did your health professional sort of speak to you about the fact that there may be some sexual problems or it's something that you could face or was it not? Not even to this day. And I've had MS for a long time. Nope. It's something that's why I talk about it. I learned a lot from my US MSs. Um, shout out to Myelin and Melanin. Um, I don't like a podcast on them about MS and sex and disability and sex because it's important to me. It's important to them. But we had the conversation after conversation that no one's health professional asks you because like most illnesses and disabilities, it's very much, are you alive? Okay, great. That's, that's the bare minimum. And that's great. But what about living? Being alive and living are two separate things. And, you know, I'm getting bladder dysfunction, which is a massive issue when you're having sexual intercourse. I mean, I make jokes about, you know, like people love water sports in set bed and, you know, you get paid for that. That's great. But it's not always, it's not, you know, people's confidence different. And, you know, you've not even in a bladder clinic gone to me, well, how's your sex life? If your blood is doing this and it's quite intense down there or you've got a catheter or something, how do you navigate that for pleasure? Can you navigate that for pleasure? And then if I add in just how like males deal with it and they deal with like sexual dysfunction and, you know, erectile dysfunction, is no one no one's asking the question so i've onboarded on many studies in the last like year or so where we're talking about this openly to be like we need like some sort of process in the nhs and health overall where people have these discussions it might be the fact that the people in power in the hospitals and nurses the doctors and stuff don't have either the training to speak about it are so overrun with other things they don't actually have the sport to support support to facilitate it because we've been in a pandemic they are overrun with work neurologists ms nurses normal like they are so overrun so i understand why it's kind of been you know not top priority so that's why i try and help people advocate to ask the question because i do think sometimes it's embarrassment of like going to someone oh, do you have sex then I think the only question I've been asked because, you know, I am a she, her, they, them. But, you know, to most people, I just look like a girl and I have a womb. So it's very much like, are you having kids? You've got MS. Well, I've never I've never said anything to you. So I think if I really want kids, I would probably go to you like, how do I do that? And how does this work? I haven't. But that was only their only concern was like your womb to procreate. Why well, my womb's pleasure? <laughs> What, what about my pleasure in life and that was when I started being like this is weird that no one asks it's... so I started asking on my own podcast like well how's your sex life anyone's ever asked you about yours and the amount of people that were like I've never had that conversation no one seems to care and I don't even know how to bring it up because I get overwhelmed by appointments I go in they say some things it feels like a well when they leave yeah when I've been watching like on a similar sort of note when I've been watching tv lately there's so many Viagra adverts that come up and it's like it's okay to just like shove that on a tv advert and it and it's you know it's socially acceptable but it's not acceptable enough for people to talk about it in the doctors it doesn't it just doesn't seem to quite add up like you say if people aren't discussing it especially when you know you're bringing up that you've got bladder problems and things you'd think that someone would join the dots and have those discussions also, if you are trying to go to me, oh, are you going to procreate? Are you not going to ask me the question next to it to be like, but how is your sex life? Like, can you have sex? Do you need a sex assistance? I've got friends that like are disabled. They have different ailments and some are blind and some have ADD. Like there's so many, but they can all have kids. But you've never considered like, well, do you need assistance? Do you need like, you know, a plan of action here where you can you know have pleasure but I think that just leans to the fact that when you have a disability or an illness you're so instantly desexualized and sex is not right for anyone or they just don't believe you have sex that of course they're not going to conversate about it because they don't think that we do and you said that um you've spoken to a lot of people in the US who have MS about like um more sexual related problems and things with the condition do you think that there's kind of like based on it's a British problem because people are a little a little bit like you know there's like this whole thing about British people being a little bit awkward and shy and things in that way or do you think it's just just a coincidence we're um a weird country in the sense of like come on we like have carry on we have all those things which are very like you know tongue in cheek but that's what we're like we're very much like it's like that kind of thing where like it's all behind closed doors and we're all freaks behind closed doors but we're not gonna show that outwardly so you know like I don't speak to sex with my mum, that kind of thing. People have like, you don't talk about what you do. 
in America, sex is like like the number one conversation. If you're not selling it visually, you're talking about it. And I think it's definitely a British thing because I don't think we open up that conversation enough. Like I just think I talk about anyone I've ever met. Like honestly, if you just phoned anyone on my phone, they'd be like, "Has Roxanne spoken to you about sex?" They'd be like, "Yeah." She doesn't stop. I'd be like, "I know." It's like my favorite subject. It doesn't matter. I'm having it. I always want to make feel liberated and make people feel liberated just for themselves like you know it's nice to feel wanted love and sexy that's all I can say how do you obviously like with your friends and people in your phone but like you say that you have um frequent conversations with them about sex and things like that but how do you open up the conversations to start with perhaps with like a health professional or someone new do you have like a specific approach before I didn't have an approach because it probably wasn't even a priority. My priority was like, what is MS? How am I treating this? What should I go forward? I didn't really know how to navigate life. So I had to figure that out first. But when I did, I, it was like, you know, from speaking to other people and reading things and doing my research, I just started presenting them things. I was like, well, I am only young. I'm, I've probably still got at least 40, 50 years in my lifespan and I wouldn't enjoy it. So these are the things I'm having and it's interrupting this, this and this. Is there anything I can do? Don't get me wrong, I still have no had no help to this day. I do it all by myself. And I do it from, like I said, by doing my own research and speaking to other people and then kind of putting together like a plan of things that seem to work for other people. And maybe I should try, I try it. And then I end up with like a yes or no list of like, yeah, that's great. That's like horrible, don't do that. And then I learned the right way of speaking about sex or sexual dysfunction so that's why I kind of advocate because I will go into a room in the world just now and just be like right we don't speak about sex enough with MS and you've got to do better and how do we get this done how do we create this and especially someone that's brown I find it's like they get a, the conversations are weirder because it's like they are a bit more cagey to certain conversations and as you probably know yourself our sexual health and overall health as a brown disabled person comes with a whole other obstacle level so I have just made it, I've probably just like, you know, deep breath. I'm just going to say it. I'm just felt like, you know, but I am an Aries. I am a fire sign. So I just present it to the table and I've got to the point of like, I don't even care what your response is anymore because it has to be done and I need the answers. So I've realized that you work for me and I don't work for you. Obviously, you know, you mentioned that there's like some challenges as being a member of like the brown community, but also you touched on um, being LGBTQ plus as well. Evidently, we're aware of some of the challenges that people from the LGBTQ plus community face when it comes to sort of accessing healthcare, getting the right um, sort of treatments and things and having some of those discussions with their health professionals. I know obviously you were at Pride. What are some of your own experiences of like speaking to healthcare professionals as an LGBTQ plus person or just like within the MS community itself? Well, like I say, there's not many of us that are visible. So that's something like I make sure that I'm visible so that if anyone else is queer or black or brown and they want to see someone with MS that looks like them or at least has similar experiences, I've made myself visible so they cannot feel less, they can feel less alone basically. Um, but like I said, people just see me as a straight woman, don't they? Because there's no overly identifying features that would make them question. So I just get that basic level of care. No, you know, my room is there to procreate. It's, you know, I date a girl, but, you know, it's, that's that's what I should be considered. It's just very, um, it's a very straight narrative you deal with. Um and when I speak about it, sometimes you get backlash. Some people are like, well, it's not about bringing brown, is it? What's so different between your experience and my experience with MS? Well, I didn't say my experience was worse or better than yours. I'm just saying that like there's less visibility. Um, and thankfully, companies like MS Trust and MS Society, they, don't, they didn't really have that opinion. They were more like, well, what can we do to make this better? And how can we create better visibility for everyone? Because ultimately, we're all together. We all have visibility. We're closer to the cure. That's just how I see it. Um, and also as someone that's queer or I'm not even talking to myself, talking to my like my trans brothers and sisters and stuff, like, and my non-binary people, there's no drugs with us in mind. There's no drugs with hormonal transformations, gender transformation, like there's none that take that on consideration. So people are taking drugs, 
and I don't really know what the effects are going to be like overall and if anyone with MS knows that MS is kind of hormonal especially if you are femme presenting or you know cisgendered at birth you every MS that I've spoken to says that week before your period they're like I don't even know myself like I'm so emotional I can't control it all my MS starts like going insane and I just what do I do like and it's not something that we talk about and I've seen someone I think it's called Rachel on Twitter she, she speaks about MS and hormones when you get to um oh my god what am I looking for the word is menopause, when, menopause thank you <laughs> when you go through menopause that's also another hormonal um journey so I don't see what's the difference between that periods and gender transition and why are none of the drugs considering any of those things and that's for me is the biggest issue being queer is the all the flags that say I'm just gonna look at you and decide what you are I think hospitals in general should be asking people who you are what you identify or like what your pronouns are what gender do you assign to and you can flag those all up we're a computer system life like for all the data people take in you can't flag these up so that you know that there are they them they're easy they're she her they're gender transitioning they're queer and they don't want kids just ask these questions and flag them up so you can stop wasting time on conversations that people don't want to have but maybe concentrate on the ones that they do and I think that is probably a data processing issue in the NHS like their systems are a bit old um I think it needs updating just in that sense Mm, I think that's definitely true because you know when you just go obviously like not hating on the NHS because they do really great work but when you go to like a GP appointment you see the little screen and they've just got like your data on it it wouldn't take a lot to add in a couple of extra boxes to kind of add some more of those details about who you are as a person no, I absolutely agree. And I love the NHS too, because they literally, I'm here talking to you because of them. But I think it makes their life easier more than it makes mine. Like it's just, it's easier for everyone. And it you get more time out of those 15 minute appointments that we get maybe once or twice a year. If everything is just done correctly, and that's nothing to do with the doctors and the nurses, that's everything to do with the system in place that controls it. And that's my biggest issue. And every time I've spoken to a neurologist or um, a nurse, especially in like going to MS Frontiers and all these things that I do, they're all for it. They all want that. They all want better neurology care and better help and better systems that make their jobs easier because who wouldn't? So you mentioned um, that you're in a relationship currently. How did you discuss MS and sort of some of the sexual challenges that might come with that to your partner either when you were first diagnosed or when you first sort of started dating well when we first started dating I was still in the lupus stage of life (laughs) where we've had lupus and it was just something I'm like a very open person as you probably can tell but you know I was just like you know um I'm queer and you know I have lupus it's not really at that point it's not really affected me but you know I'm just going to be I probably said that to them knowing me at a pub (laughs) on the first day having a drink just just talking but that's just who I am um it's not the same for everyone I have conversations all the time people that are like I don't I date someone for like four months and so I'm told them I'm like yeah I get it you want to know that person's there for the long run sometimes before you you give them the full bill and receipt of life but for me I just said it so when I was diagnosed with MS they were kind of with me and they kind of saw that journey so that was beneficial and they saw like my wins my losses my tears and my smiles so I was kind of lucky in that sense but I still had to have the conversation so still the, the weird conversation was like you know what's not you you're gorgeous I love you you turn me on so much I physically don't have the energy though so you start having to learn how to adapt like what can I do that maybe is not this like say full penetration or full this but maybe it's just like telling you you're beautiful or you telling me I'm beautiful like you know what's the little build-up things that we can do to keep feeling connected and sweet and in love that doesn't put pressure on either people because I'm dealing with MS and adapting my sex life for it but they're also adapting to me having MS in their sex life it's like you know they don't have to date me they could date anyone that didn't have MS if they wanted to but they're still here so I've tried to you know take that on board and being like well if you're here you care you love me I'm just going to tell you the truth you know and I think I've come to a place with my MS after a few years it's like I've got to be honest 
to you know I've got to be honest with myself in the situation I'm in because even if I ended up alone I would just want to know that I'd been true to myself more than anything I think yeah that's really important we funny enough uh, two podcast episodes ago now we did like an episode on uh, relationships and MS and that's one of the things that we said was like there's no perfect time to tell people but also it's about having those conversations and um, obviously if you tell someone or disclose your MS or some of the challenges you may be facing and that person isn't happy with it or can't go along with you on that journey then they're not the right person for you and it's about kind of accepting yourself and knowing that it's a two-way a two-way street it's not about like pleading for acceptance from someone else yeah absolutely and the thing about MS is the biggest issue for most people is they don't know what it is and they have all these thoughts and feelings and if you go I've got MS it's incurable people think that you're like dying instantly and you're like you have this whole conversation I'm not actually dying it's just an autoimmune disease that just takes me out of the game sometimes And when you really you know like any relationship it might be like it's the same as me going oh let, let's go on a date let's date and then halfway through it, I go to you Emma you know what like I really like you but my goal in life is to live in Australia and I'm planning to that in a year and a half and you're like, well, I never want to do that. Then really, no, this is not, this is not, we can be cool, we might even be friends, but maybe this is not the connection that's meant to happen. I see it as something like that. I know it's a bit more, you know, intense because it's our health, but it's how I see it. It's just, it's just, it's the bags I come with and I need someone that's going to like take my bag away, not like make me feel bad for being myself because there's nothing wrong with having MS. And some, to be honest, some of the people I've met with MS are the most amazing people I've ever met. So that's, you know, and I just think it's your loss because this person's awesome and you probably suck and that's okay. So on that sort of subject of like some people just don't get MS, what MS is, or they don't really understand the ins and outs of it. Say um, if you're in a in a relationship and your partner just isn't getting it and they think that obviously you're saying like, oh, I experience fatigue, so maybe let's not be sexual tonight. And they kind of think, oh, this is just an excuse. It's a cop out. How do you kind of have those conversations to get them to understand what MS is and how it's affecting you or would you kind of not bother with that conversation and just say like this person is not I would kind of be it's really hard like so everyone deals with the whole fact if you go I'm tired there's guarantee something going to you I'm tired too I totally understand you're like Mm -hmm. you do but you also don't and that that's people's pet hate but I think like with a partner I think you can you can have a plan if you know you've only got like 20 spoons every day, maybe you just, I know it's sad and people go, well, it's really hard to schedule in sex, but maybe you schedule in sex every Wednesday and you know to save your spoons for that. And they know that, you know, because you, you just trying to reassure someone that's actually not you. You know, it's like that. I think it's also because of TV programming of being like, oh, I've got a headache, darling, I can't do it. That kind of thing, I think, goes through people's minds. And that's not the case. Although with MS, we do get some headaches. So I will like, you know, but um. If you truly, like, you show them, I go to MS Trust, I go to MS Society, I'll be like, this is what I'm dealing with. Look at this podcast, look at this advocate, like, these are the situations that we're dealing with. And to be honest, like, people that are around me, they generally do their own research too. And I encourage them to, because, you know, sometimes with MS, explain yourself is really hard, because either we've got, like, uh, my words are slurring which happens all the time or I'm not really connecting the right words together to tell you something and maybe you're not really understanding it and um, so I always say you know like have a look further but you know I am tired and it's not you and I do find you beautiful and I understand this is probably frustrating because you've probably got your own needs you've got your own hormones sexual drive I get it but maybe we just need to do it at this time of day or on this day in this way and um, please don't think and then when you do have the energy you just rock their world as much as you can and they'll know that like to be honest like you're probably more frustrated than they are you know like yeah you, at least you're not a tired one you can go like watch porn and have one out if you want but like maybe I can't because I, I can't even sell right now um yeah there's some really great tips there actually my next question was going to be like how would you start those conversations but I think that's kind of covered that one the next thing is that often people with disabilities are either completely desexualized or it can become like a fetish thing what have been some of your experiences of that? I've had both. Social media is a well place when you make yourself visible. And especially because I have like a disability cane with a few other additions. Um, I've had like wild messages of people being like, oh, hello. Um, I saw that you have a disability and like, 
that really turns me on. So I'm like, I'm the worst person. I'm like, oh, really? Does it? And they're like, yeah, yeah. I'm like, so, so why is that? Like, what is it about me being disabled? Because I don't, a lot of my friends are like, no, block, block. And I think that's good. But I, I want to know. I want to tell me more. Why? Why? What is it about me? And then some people were like, oh, you know, um, they pinpointed me to another advocate. I followed was like, well, they're in a the wheelchair. And I love that because they're almost helpless. And it means they can't get away. And I love to care for people. I love to take care of people. So, you know, I want to wash them. And, and, and I'm like, yeah, it's kind of weird. It's not like you don't want help as a disabled person. It's not like I might not need you to help me wash my hair. But it's how you're addressing it. And I get everyone has a fetish. And I appreciate the honesty. So I'm in a weird place. It's like I almost appreciate your honesty of being really honest and transparent with what it is. I'm probably not going to be like with you or on board onto that. But I'm intrigued on in why you feel like that. Like, what is it? And... A lot of people was just like they have this need to help or to, you know, feel empowered. And they seem to think that we're so depowered, which is not true, that they gain power for our, from our depowerment. And they and some people just have fetishes about having sex with people in wheelchairs because either the functionality of a wheelchair involved or and it's a wild thing. So it's a bit of a navigation for people, especially I think on dating apps, to reveal or not reveal that and also what's gonna come from that. Because people are like trolls nowadays. They just say the wildest things. And then you have the desexualization, which is like I've on Twitter I've read the wildest stuff like oh, you shouldn't have sex with disabled, or why would someone have sex with you because, like, of this and this? And you're like, really? I mean, some there's some very, very hot, beautiful, gorgeous, disabled people with no limbs at all. Like, I'm sorry that you're that's your mentality, but you were missing out on, like, the best sex you probably will ever have. But that's just because of how you feel. And that's unfortunate because then... Other people that have disabilities, if they don't see themselves being loved or desired in the correct way, can really affect your personality and your, you know, your like self worth. And I hate to see that because, yeah, I just I don't think it's okay. So it's just a bit of a, so it's, it's a weird balance between the over sexualized and the under sexualized like I will put out podcast content and content on my social media of being like disabled people are sexy and we're gorgeous and look at us rock and roll and we're amazing but I always get the backlash of like oh darling I'd love to like you know with your cane you know you can't move and it's like dude like, if you're into bondage just let me know like calm down you know how do you like you say it can sort of take a toll on your mental health sometimes how do you manage that obviously being in the public eye on social media um I take everything with a pinch of salt but I went through because I went through such intense MS depression where I was like literally borderline suicidal I had to go through a phase of self-acceptance accepting myself and I done a lot of like um positivity stuff a lot of self-help stuff with my partner who helped me with this and just was like you know I don't echo totally the power of now being in the minute understanding you know how RuPaul says you know what anyone thinks about you is none of your business I kind of now live by that like I don't really care you're behind the screen are you going to be that brave in real life it's very very debatable you are so I just take it with a pinch of salt but that's taken years to get to that space so I you know it's not everyone's not going to feel like that but maybe in a few years when you've dealt with so many people being like that, you kind of just go, you know what, you almost expect it. Was that also part of your body positivity journey? Because, you know, whether you've got a disability or not, it can be a real challenge to feel, as we said earlier, like feel sexy, feel like you're worthy of that kind of thing. As humans, I think sometimes we can really struggle with that self-confidence. How do you sort of make sure that you have the confidence to like because they feel sexy and and things like clothes that. clothes it's always been fashion for me like fashion's always made me feel sexy as a man it's like avant-garde strange or like just a cute little two-piece from like a top shop I've always used clothes maybe as like a barrier 
or like my armor to the universe to present my personality and how I'm feeling and my moods and my art because I I did study art and everyone has their own canvas but for me it's always been clothes like I just love to use clothes as an art tool so I use that and I know most people think you have to be naked to be sexy but I don't think you do I think sometimes clothes are the sexiest thing it allows you to peel back layers reveal things um I don't know who said it but the right lipstick does a lot for women like you know or you know the right pair of shoes or it you find that thing and you write it down what's those things it's like when I'm going through depression someone asked me recently oh, I'm really depressed like what do you do I was like you know what like my partner said to me one day what makes you happy like what makes you smile and I was like I don't even know what are you talking about they're like no you watch movies you've watched tv programs you know certain people that when you speak to you always smile if you watch this movie it makes you laugh every time write those things down so in those moments when you feel like off you can go and pick your favorite movie or pick up your favorite book and put it on and know that's going to help you transform your mood and I was like oh so I do that with clothes so I pre-plan my outfits I mean my loungewear and my going out wear but I also pre-plan my sexy stuff like I, I weirdly bought heels don't know why I meant to be modeling for someone at an actual torture garden event which is actually a sex positive event and I was like oh uh, I think I need to wear heels like I maybe tried the cane does not work cannot walk in them for love and money they are beautiful but like you know the Versace shoes that were going on the platform ones mm -hmm. um I cannot walk in them whatsoever they're gonna have to go back but you know I tried yeah but I have other heels that you know you can wear heels lined in bed you know there's moments so I just have those tools in my kit now that I use it's like this bra set or those pair of shoes or this lipstick or this vibrator um, I'm always about the wand for people. I'm like, if you have hypersensitivity or undersensitivity, get the sex wand. It is so intense, especially if you have no sensitive, like if you cannot feel anything. It really did help me bring back sensation. Um, and I'm always about those things that just, you know, have your favourite porno. What is your favourite? Everyone's got one. Everyone's got something they like. Just have it on, write a little diary of yourself of what you like and what makes you happy. And buy the things that make you happy if you can because I know we're all in the cost of living crisis and stuff tight you know but if you can find it and some of the sales ASOS of sales I was literally on summers the other day it's like less than 20 quid for a good cute set buy it for yourself have it ready so that you want to feel sexy you can use the bath pamper yourself have a nice bath set tones and moods with candles and smells like there's there's so many things that can help you feel sexier but it does take a bit of navigating with, you know, what does and doesn't work for you. And make sure you write it down because of MS brains. Some you'd ask me the same question two days ago or two days after. And I'd be like, what? <laughs> Cause I can't remember. Would that be your tip for other people with MS? Like if they're struggling with their own body confidence, would you sort of say like take time for yourself and do those little things that make you feel good? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's, you've got to remember, it's about you. I know we have all these people that feel the emotions from us having MS. You've got family members, you've got partners, all that stuff. But if you don't love yourself, how the hell are you going to love someone else, right? And like, you know, they're all the cliche comments that people say, but it's so true. Like, if you don't um, fall in love with yourself in any sense, it could be as simple as I just love my hands. And you start there and you go up from there. And you figure out like what that is that really makes you like yourself. We all have great features. We've got great personalities. And probably most of us have a really great style. Just use that to make yourself feel better about yourself. I know sometimes it's hard because I have a friend that has carers. And it's a whole kerfuffle about getting them to kind of help them feel empowered as a disabled person so that they feel themselves. And that comes sometimes for them with makeup. And they've had like, you know, carers going, well, not, I'm not doing that. And they're like, well, you're here to care for me. And that actually makes me feel the best out of all the drugs and stuff you give me. So like, you need to help facilitate this so that I can feel sexually empowered. And they have a whole relationship. And people question all the time on TikTok, like, what? How are these two people in a wheelchair that look like they can't move having sex? And they're like, watch me, I'll show you. And I love that about them. Yeah, like you say, some not everyone's going to have the same experiences or the same things that work for them or make them feel good. But it's about like learning what makes what works for you and what makes you feel great. 
and that includes people because sometimes the person you're with or the people around you are not the right people and sometimes it does take you know scaling back a little bit and then meeting new people thankfully we have communities now especially with MSs. um we should probably have an ms date and something or something like you know where ms can match up to date because there's something special about people really understanding the journey you're going on and then just to finish up i guess um we've covered obviously what you can do if you're not feeling 100 percent body confident but what are some of the tips you would give to people with ms who maybe some of the obviously it depends from symptom to symptom but uh if some of your ms symptoms are affecting your sex life what tips would you give well first of all i would say i know it's the worst conversation or the hardest conversation to feel people feel like they can have with their gps and we're just an MS. flag it up to them tell them that you're having an issue um I know some of us are very introverted write it down if you don't want to say it out loud like just give them a piece of paper and be like this is the issue we'll send them an email if that's an option for you because sometimes it just is a drug or a a tweak or something that will actually bring the sensations back and the feelings back for you but if we don't ask we don't get and that's kind of the life we live um other than that I would say you know use toys um, find like definitely try the one if you can it's not that expensive um, you can get them in many sizes and they help bring sensation you can actually use it on your body it doesn't have to be sexual like so it's actually a one massager so a lot of people use it to bring back sensation just in your joints and stuff in general but you know you can gravitate towards it making it sexual um, speak to your partners massively um, about what de- uh, you're dealing with and try and change it on its head like I said about the joke about you know water sports you know well, one of my friends from America was like you know I was having sex rocks and it's like really really good and I thought it was coming but it didn't come I peed myself a little bit and I was like mortified I was like did he even know and they were like no he didn't even notice I was like because he's not thinking that it's you freaking out and trust me I've not met a lot of people that say no to sex when it when when they like you already in your scenario if you're transparent with who you are just let them know it might pee a little bit they might be into it they might be into it. they might not be but at least you'll you know you can you've got boundaries between both of you like maybe if your bladder's not working correctly they might not want to but you're respecting their space and they're respecting yours so i just think conversations based what i say have as many conversations as you can and try to find things to adapt so like you know you can have like sex wedges so if you're super fatigued and you can't get into the right position you can have a sex wedge that will help prop you up there's like so many sexual aids that you can explore to help you in certain situations and then try and make things sexy i know it sounds like how do you make it sexy but there are ways of making things sexy but you have to talk to people to see maybe what it is that would also help them feel sexy about your sexiness that's brilliant thank you so much for those tips and obviously for speaking us uh, speaking with us today roxy no, that's my pleasure thank you for having me now if this was a commercial podcast here's where there usually would be an ad break but as we're a charity we don't do that so instead we'd like to tell you about about some of the resources that we have about sex and ms if this episode has left you wanting to find out more about sex and MS, our website has lots of useful information and resources. Um, we have our A to Z pages. So if you head over to A to Z of MS in the top right corner, look under S and you'll find uh, information on sexual problems for men and sexual problems for women with MS. We've also got an Ask the Expert with our very own Leslie and Denise, as well as, um, as, well as our MS Trust online shop, which offers two different publications on the topic so however you like to take in your information there's an option for you speaking of denise and leslie let's hear what they had to say when you spoke to them helena i would like to say a big welcome to leslie catterall and denise middleton two ms specialists and i think it's fair to say that the, the, they have a kind of special interest in sexual prom- problems associated with the ms am i right to saying this yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> We've uh, used uh, Leslie and Denise for several things, both at conference and in other videos as well. So I'm quite excited to to get chatting to you both today. Um, should we start by by talking about why sexual problems can happen for uh, in women with MS? Okay, so um, we kind of classify MS symptoms into three kind of areas, and that's not just Um, sexual difficulties in MS that's kind of most symptom profiles and um, 
thinking about the kind of cause directly linking to MS itself, we kind of call that primary cause. And it's as a direct result of MS lesions within the brain and the spinal cord. And that can affect sexual response, intimate feelings, physical arousal and orgasm. And it's directly related to the disease process. So the inflammatory process, the demyelination, the lesions that occur. Um, and as we know, MS affects the, the brain and the spinal cord. Um, so that's, that's a primary cause of sexual difficulties in MS. Um, another area is thinking about secondary causes. So that's related to other MS symptoms like fatigue, um, bladder and bowel issues, mobility, and that can also affect the sexual response and sexual activity. And then thinking about tertiary causes, that's kind of around cultural, psychological, emotional aspects of living with, with MS. So it's quite complicated. The, the whole sure, it sounds, it it sounds, it's, it's not just a straightforward answer to that question. <laughs> Which tends to be the case with MS in a lot of things, doesn't it? <laughs> it does, it yeah. does. Um, but it's how, a big jigsaw puzzle, Helena. Yeah, it really is, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. With some bits missing and maybe yeah. the duplicated bits and all yeah. sorts of things yeah. going on. Um, but how common are sexual problems in MS and what sort of typical issues are experienced for people with female genitalia? Um, I, I know that some people might even know that might even know that there is a sort of a, a common thing to have any issues we had this comment on instagram actually uh, one of the most common changes to having sex after being diagnosed or common experience that you heard about um, mm. i have no clue if it made a difference and uh, again showing that people talk about that there might be something but what is it <laughs> okay so it is common um it it's really unclear, actually, and pretty underreported, probably particularly by women. Um, but up to about 80 percent of people, well, sorry, women with MS report sexual difficulties compared to the um, general population, which is about 40 percent. So it's quite high. Yeah, I was just going to say it might not, but it might not be that these sexual difficulties happen right at the beginning of diagnosis. No. It may be a bit further on in the course of the disease. Yes. Thinking about that, that question, is it common after diagnosis? Not, not always. Mm. Um, and, you know, sexual difficulties, um, if we're thinking about partnered sex, can obviously lead to relationship difficulties, as can uh, uh, living with the diagnosis of MS. And up to 71% of people report sexual difficulties um, have relationship problems. Um, and people with MS report a higher incidence of pain and fatigue and depression, which we know kind of links into sexual difficulties as well. So it is common. Mm -hmm. There was a study at the beginning of the pandemic that showed that people um, with MS that were having regular orgasms um, had experienced less pain, fatigue and depression. So it's an important thing to, to get yeah. right, really. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. Right. Yeah. It's yeah, an important thing to bring up. Yeah. Well, on that topic, actually, because um, you were saying underreported, and I've spoken to a few people um, who all sort of most of them say that it's not routinely brought up when they go mm -hmm. to, to see their um, MS nurses or, you know, their health professionals. As MS nurses, I'm guessing you guys probably routinely <laughs> ask what's going on uh, with your, especially we talk about the female patients this time, but, but um, how, how important do you think it is that for, for MS nurses to sort of proactively ask rather than wait to be told? I think it's as important as any other MS symptom. It's something that we certainly routinely bring up in each consultation with our patients, but whether that's because we, we feel a bit more com comfortable and confident talking about it. Um, some um, Many MS nurses now are very experienced in discussing sexual difficulties, as you know, um, in the training with the, the, the MS Trust do for newly imposed um, uh, MS clinical specialists, sex and MS is, is one of the topics that's discussed. Um, but some, some MS nurses might find it difficult. Sometimes um, 
healthcare professionals feel perhaps they're being a little bit too intrusive mm. so if that isn't asked then the patient could always try and open up the conversation saying that they've been having um, difficulties um is it due to my ms uh, they could use the um, brilliant ms trust booklets and say oh i've been reading this this is something i'm experiencing is there any help for it um, or they could perhaps bring a list to clinic that um, they write down maybe their top three problems. And if sex is up there, then they can say, look, I'd like to discuss these issues today. And they don't act, they can hand the piece of paper over so they don't have to actually bring up the subject of sex. Um, and there are a number of resources and tools now that help healthcare professionals opening up that subject. So it's certainly something that's a lot more talked about. And, and if a healthcare professional doesn't feel comfortable asking it, discussing it with the patient, they should hopefully say, look, it's not something I know much about, but I'll find somebody who feels more confident to talk to you about it. I think that sounds brilliant. So <laughs> that's sort of what we, we want to hear, really. And um, I mean, if if people are struggling, I think you gave some really good ideas there, what, what to do. But I guess also to say, you guys have heard it all before, haven't you? There's, it's nothing to be ashamed of to talk about. Exactly, no. yeah. No, but I think sexual health and sexual well-being is, is kind of up in the social media now as well, mm. isn't it? You mm. hear about it a lot. Um, I think it is being talked about much more than it, it used to, definitely. Yeah. Um, um, and in, in different ways as well, because it's yeah, not just yeah, about the sort of partnered yeah. sex, but a lot yeah, yeah. more. Yeah, absolutely. Many people, yeah. I don't know, it's just, yeah. it's, it's not yeah. as what we were told before it was. Uh, yeah, no. Yeah. no. Helene, thinking about, um, you asked as well, somebody on Instagram had put, you know, what, what are some of the typical issues that people mm. experience? Um, so again, there's been surveys that have been done and up to 72% um, report difficulty with the ability to orgasm. This is women. Mm -hmm. Decreased libido, 60%. So that's quite, that's quite high. Yeah. Um, altered sensation, including hypersensitivity and reduced sensation. That's up to kind of 62, 65%. Uh, decreased lubrication, um, 46%. And 17% of women with MS report painful sex. Now, kind of painful sex is, is quite complicated in MS. So um, it, it's relating to that primary, primary cause, you know, with, with the lesions, etc. And it can include um, things like something called neuropathic vulvodynia, which is like a burning or itching sensation. So people can experience burning and itching sensations in their, in their skin, in their limbs, etc., but also in their genitals. Um, vaginismus, which is muscle spasm um, of the vagina on penetration, um, and also decreased lubrication can cause um, painful sex. But all of those things, so the burning, the itching, the muscle spasm, um, and the decreased lubrication are experienced by people without MS. Mm. And those symptoms are also quite common in people who are post-menopause. Yeah. Up to 59% of women who are post-menopausal who haven't got MS report those symptoms. So thinking about the menopause and what other kind of symptoms that can chuck into the mix with yeah. MS and sex yeah. is important as a woman of a age. <laughs> <laughs> we need to consider that. Yeah. Um, as well as, you know, younger women might experience those problems, but with, with the menopause affecting kind of urogenital symptoms and processes, then, then that's something to consider as well. So there's a lot of different yeah. um, issues that people can experience. Since there are so many of, of the different things, what, what ones are sort of easy to, to treat or um, which ones can you, can you get help with easy? I think the easiest one to treat would be um, decreased lubrication. Uh, so there are many um, uh, lubricants that people can buy over the counter, uh, uh, boots, any of the pharmacies. Um, there's um, certain internet sites uh, that, um, that that stock their own brand or there are well-known brands. I don't know if we're allowed to mention the makes of <laughs> Oh, you can say brands. With, yeah. <laughs> well, I think Durex is the most common. Yeah. They produce um, very nice, warming and uh, tingling uh, lubricants. They are, unfortunately, some of the shop 
um, brands products contain glycerin that can make the lubricant feel a bit gritty and the problem with glycerin is it can cause um, urinary tract infections so we know that women with MS mm. um, can have bladder issues so if you're using then a, 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 a lubricant with glycerin in that that could add an increase in infection so that's something we try and avoid um, there are lots of um, organic products so there is a product called Yes, which is um, a, a, an organic product. And they, uh, the company, um, produce um, lubricants as well as uh, vaginal moisturizers as well. So when Denise was talking about uh, women menopausal age, there are, just as us older ladies, should we moisturize our faces, we should be moisturizing our vaginas. Um, and so there are vaginal moisturizers that you can use two or three times a week just to add some lubrication into your, your vagina. And, and then there are the, um, they do a water-based or an oil-based lubricant, which um, if used together can produce a very nice double glide, slip slide effect, which can be very pleasurable or so I'm told. <laughs> um, yeah, so there, there's lots out there. Also, if people um, are of a menopausal age and they do, they are experiencing decreased lubrication and vaginal dryness, they could perhaps see their GP because it may be that a, a small dose of um, estrogen in a pessary uh, can help with with the dryness. That's brilliant. And some of these products can be prescribed by yeah. um, GP. So the Yes product, some GPs will prescribe it, but others won't due to cost. It's not yeah. on their kind of. Um, What's the word formulary, formulary. yeah, <laughs> formulary. yeah. <laughs> but they have other products other yeah. moisturizers that are on the formulary yeah. um but they they can be a bit gritty yeah um, as, as leslie said so often it's about finding what suits you particularly yeah. i mean i heard a really enlightened gp had suggested a product called wet platinum mm -hmm. which denise and i hadn't heard of but actually is available on amazon and um, it is quite expensive when we've had a look but a, the one of my patients found it very helpful. So there, there is a lot out there nowadays. Yeah. So you can also then, because one of the questions we had, if, if you don't, if you can't talk to your MS nurse about it or you feel not uncomfortable, your GP is a, yes. a, another yeah, point definitely. of contact. Yeah. 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 I think um, is it, it depends. Patients, whoever they feel comfortable with in bringing yeah. up the subjects, that's who they should talk to. Um, and obviously... Um, that's who they're going to feel more comfortable and open up that conversation and it's going to be a two-way thing hopefully yeah you were mentioning pain I mean mm -hmm. it, there is obviously some pain medication that we can take for 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 some of the um the MS weird tingling and burning sensation would they help sort of with the vaginal area as well or yeah, I mean, they can, because painful sex can be down to the vaginal dryness mm. and lack of lubrication. So yeah. definitely, if that's the cause, then um, they're, they're, they're great for helping that pain. There are, um, so some women with MS can have um, sensation of hypersensitivity, mm. and that can cause pain um, on intercourse. And there are, uh, you know, an easy tip is using some uh, cooling sensation. So even adding, using an ice cube and using that as part of foreplay can be very helpful or even you can get these nice gel packs that you pop in the freezer you can use those um if if it is extremely uncomfortable then a medication can be tried uh gabapentin or carbamazepine uh some neurologists will prescribe and hopefully that could be helpful and it is really on a trial and error basis yeah, isn't yeah, it yeah. um and also um some of the um ssri antidepressants they can help with painful um intercourse they, they, they can also try different textures and, and touch. So wear a different um, lingerie and try and, and different, bring in different um, sensations into to the mix. And also, I don't know if you've heard of body mapping, but that's quite a good um, a good exercise that patients could do usually as a couple. But it you know it takes the focus off of intercourse, but just um, concentrates on looking at areas of the body that are either too sensitive or may cause discomfort, and finding those that are more pleasurable so it can be a good fun exercise for a couple to do and also increase their intimacy that's a really good point and we are talking about that in our book uh, uh the emma's trust book for for sex and women so mm. we'll pop a link in the show notes so people can can have a look at that and okay. um, you mentioned before about um bladder issues um because 
you know, things are connected. <laughs> is it likely if you're having bladder issues that you might also have sexual issues? Unfortunately, it is. So um, the areas in the spinal cord where a, per a, a person might have lesions um, can also ca uh, cause problems with uh, sexual uh, dysfunction as well. Uh, so yes, um, it, it, sadly, it can be can be linked. Um, but uh, there are lots of ways of managing um, bladder issues, and it's always good if you are if a, if a woman is experiencing bladder difficulties that they they speak to either their MS professional or um, their GP, or they can be referred to a continence service. And there's lots of um, medications and and strategies out there to help bladder symptoms. Um, and if um, a good tip is always try and empty your bladder before you have sex. Uh, if if you're unfortunately you need to have a catheter in situ, that still shouldn't hinder you having intercourse. You can just discreetly tape it to the side of your leg, or a, a suprapubic catheter is, is more conducive to an with an active sex life. Um, a, a woman can pop a, a towel discreetly on the bed in case there is any leakage. And if, if it's safe to do so, and there's enough um, maneuverability in the shower, that's always a good place to, to, um, to try that because then, you know, any embarrassing moments are washed away, as it were. Yeah. <laughs> Just don't slip over. Yeah, yeah. you're safe. Yeah. <laughs> and the handrails. <laughs> handrails, that's yeah. the way to go. Yeah. With a suprapubic catheter, um, it's surgically um, placed and it's um, usually put just above the pubic area. So um, a urethral catheter goes up through the urethra, um, which is a little bit more um, difficult with, with in intercourse. Mm. Um, so it gets in the way a little bit. So, you know, if people are still sexually active, then they can ask for a suprapubic catheter and that would require referral to a urologist um, at their local hospital. But something that you can approach your MS nurse with to oh, start exactly. with. Yeah, yeah. Or, or the GP, or the GP. You would need a referral on to the urology services at the hospital. We see many comments on loss of sensation. Um, we've talked a little bit about the hypersensitivity as well. Um, here's a comment that we received. I have numbness around my genitals and absolutely no sex drive. Uh, whereas two years before I did, I'm married and I want to remain intimate with my husband. So any advice is welcome. <laughs> so, because um, Denise and I are both very old, <laughs> Uh, yeah. <laughs> years ago there there wasn't very much to help with loss of sensation and people it tried things like tiger balm which might have stung a bit or even toothpaste because anything that increases that tingling sensation yeah can be good um but so there are now loads of products like we said earlier durex um produce tingling warming lubricants as do many um supermarkets have their own uh, own makes um so but also any things that help um with uh, loss of sensation is masturbation because uh, in that way people can get the, the rhythm and the intensity that they find helps them uh, improve their sensation and um, oral sex is always good for increasing um, the, the sensation and there are lots of um, sex aids that can also help uh, so there are uh, lots of uh, online uh, companies so one is love honey which um apparently they come in a very discreet box so if a neighbor has to take it in they wouldn't know but they produce lots of um to products that people can buy to help improve their sensation do you need something that's more than battery powered because i was listening to a, a, a <laughs> podcast with aaron booster the uh, the american neurologist and he was talking about this and he was saying you need one that you plug into the into the <laughs> socket so it's really like powerful i think, I think again it's trial and error isn't yeah. it there are there are quite a lot that you can plug in or yeah. charge up mm. but equally there are some good little bullets that you can just yeah, buy pound. in poundland yeah four a pound and yeah. they're effective he, he may have been talking about um so um 
clitoral stimulators. So these are more pads. They come that you charge, don't they? Yeah. So they're more shaped like a, a pad and they cover the whole of the um, vulval, plate. vulval plate. Yeah. And or, some of them um, increase in intensity, mm -hmm. increase in, in the hertz and the vibrations that they provide. So if somebody has got real sensation loss, they can be very helpful. I don't know if you're old enough, Helena, if you ever watched the programme Sex in the City. Oh, yes. Oh, I'm <laughs> So um, Samantha used the Hitachi magic wand um, and that is meant to be excellent because it does the it comes at the right hertz and, and you can change the frequency. So that can really help. Um, obviously, we're not recommending it for penetration. It's more for uh, 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 increasing the sensation in the clitoris, isn't it? It is. <laughs> It's really big. <laughs> you want to be yes. in that situation. <laughs> you have to say it's a disclaimer. Yeah, I do remember that episode. <laughs> Some of them as well have warming um, elements to elements. Yeah, that they warm up as well, so it's they increase the sensitivity by warming at the same time. If the opposite is the problem that you're oversensitive, um, the person who we spoke to uh, before before. We chatted to you and um, she was saying that she sometimes just feels like the whole her is just buzzing yeah. um what, what what can we recommend for people that are feeling a bit too much yeah that can be it can be very difficult and and, and very unpleasant for the mm. person again it's trying things like the cooling pads mm. or maybe trying um, one of the neuropathic pain agents like gabapentin or carbamazepine see if they help um, and again, body mapping can be a great tool to find out and avoid in the areas that are more sensitive than, than others that aren't. You've already mentioned, because my next question was about if it's common for women to have problems with climax, in which you've already said. But I, I, let me put it this way then. Do you think that maybe the pressure of always having climax within sex is, is kind of making people not want to have sex because they think, oh, it's not going to happen yeah yeah it does definitely yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I think that puts a lot of people off and yeah. um you know if people have one experience that isn't very good that's what they remember they don't remember the experiences prior to that um yeah. and it, it does it puts people off um but you're talking about climax and whether it is an issue with MS um it, it definitely is so, I mean, I, I don't know how many people would be aware the clitoris is an erectile organ, just like the penis. Um, and it engorges with blood um, in the process of arousal and excitement, which again is affected by those nerve pathways. Um, so that, that can be um, affected um, due to the lesions with the MS. Um, so it's important for people to spend a bit of extra time on foreplay, as, as Leslie said previously. Um, and that's as important as the sexual act itself. Mm. Um, so, you know, taking kind of orgasm off the table, as it were, yeah. um, and just looking at the, the kind of process of getting there and being more intimate. Um, you know, for some women, foreplay is more exciting than yeah. the actual yeah. part of sex itself. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the majority of women don't reach orgasm during intercourse. Yeah. Um, Sex is rarely mutually orgasmic in partnered sex. Um, often it's, you know, turn taken. <laughs> and uh, two out of 10 episodes of sex will be rubbish. <laughs> Six out of 10 will be all right. <laughs> two out of 10 will be great. So at best, 80% of your sex life is mediocre. So, you know, if people consider yeah. that, it yeah. takes the pressure off. Yes. I think people are often, you know, they see in social media or in movies, films, pornography, if they watch pornography, it's all about that ejaculation or that orgasm. Yeah. And that that isn't what sex needs to be. Yeah. It, it yeah. So taking the pressure off, as you say, Helena, is is important. Mm. And, and, and I think, you know, before, like you say, it's very much about the penetration, people thinking yeah, about that sort yeah. of act. But, yeah, but yeah. then obviously we're not just talking about men and women together. No, could be no, women, no, or people on their own or, or what have you. different combinations yeah. of yeah. love and sex, isn't there? Yeah. And, you know, it can be partnered, it can be single. It's, mm. it's, it's different for, for everybody. 
Um, there are there are some products as well now uh, out, out there that help achieve an orgasm. So uh, there are uh, Durex do their own. Um, spend, I think is it called Playo? Playo, yeah. And that again, I think Cosmopolitan ranked it as eighty um, percent of women that tried it achieved an orgasm, and some even had multiple orgasms. So that was great. And yes, as well, um, produce a, an orgasmic. Um, lubricant they do I yeah. can't think what it's called well, it's, like a, it's like an oil isn't it yeah so again meant to help increase orgasms so there are things that people can can buy to help as well to try it's about keeping an open mind and trying you know experimenting with new things let's talk about fatigue and energy <laughs> here's a question that we've received I have no real interest in sex. For me, it's because it doesn't really seem worth the energy to it consume. It makes me fatigue. And I guess it just doesn't make me feel as good as it used to either. Uh, other things makes me happier, but I understand that it's important for a relationship. Should I be focusing on ma- making sex more pleasurable? So there's lots of things going on in that question, mm. aren't there? <laughs> so there's, there's the fatigue, there's the, the intimacy and thinking about what makes you happy. So thinking about the fatigue part of that, that kind of question, um, you know, fatigue is really common in MS. It's probably one of the most common symptoms in MS. Um, and for a lot of people, they rate it really highly as one of their worst symptoms. So if people can link into a service that can help them manage their fatigue, that's kind of a first step. So not even thinking about sex, kind of taking a step back and looking at the fatigue as a separate MS symptom. So for example, here, we run a fatigue management course, um, which is a, a cognitive behavioral therapy course, an education course. And that's been really useful for people to learn how to manage their fatigue better. So looking at that is is one one thing not not every area is lucky enough to be able to run those courses and we appreciate that we are because we link in with the neuro rehabilitation service um so thinking about pacing activity and rest is is the way to go with fatigue um and prioritizing what's important to you so if that person feels that you know sex is important to them it's about banking some energy to be able to use in you know, a date night or, or, you know, sexual activity later on in the day, or even a couple of days later. So thinking about, and again, it, it is that kind of taking away some of that spontaneity, mm. but planning something a little bit more. So making more of an effort to think about what time of day is the best, best time of day. So, you know, some people, their most awake time of day is in the morning, not for me, sex in the morning is no good for me. <laughs> um, but, you know, for some people, when when they're awake, mostly in the morning, that's, that's great. Yeah. Um, and thinking about positioning, so which sexual position uses the least energy? So, for example, spooning, um, rather than, you know, kind of the woman being on top. Um, just just having a, a bit of an experiment around around that, but by by doing that, you're kind of trying to reduce the energy expenditure. Um, having a cold shower beforehand can cool your body temperature down. So we know that fatigue and MS is kind of very heat sensitive related. Mm. If somebody's a bit too warm, then it makes their MS symptoms a lot worse. In particular, fatigue. So that will make make that worse. So you know cooling down beforehand, um, using the stop-start method, so having little rests in between, try a bit of tantric sex maybe, and drag it out through the day, mm-hmm. so you're kind of building up to that mm. that kind of process rather than a wham-bam, thank you, ma'am approach. <laughs> it's what works for, for you, really. Um, and a quickie could be fun. Yeah. If uh, you, you want it all over, to be over, <laughs> let's get it done. <laughs> <laughs> this is my aim I'm going to do this today um so rather than having it as a long drawn out um love making session that does take up a lot of energy switch it around and and do things differently um and yeah pacing activities um not just sex but outside of sex yeah. so you're banking that energy is probably a good way to to go with fatigue management it's a tricky one, isn't it? Because planning it can sort of take out some of the yeah. spontaneity. It does, yeah. Then how do you make planning sexy? But I suppose with some of the things you were saying there, trying different things and approaching it, maybe it can be like, well, let's go on an, <laughs> an adventure of exploration yeah, and things right. like that, rather than actually putting so much pressure on yourself of 
I'm yeah. going to have sex and it's going to be great. Oh, and then it's like, it's be great. Yeah. 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 fireworks. <laughs> <laughs> but you're thinking about that, Helena, and thinking about intimacy. So often it's not, you know, when it comes to sex, it's not just about the destination. A lot of people think it's about mm. the journey as well. Mm. Um, and encouraging uh, communication with um, couples is important. So understanding what people's, likes dislikes our needs and wants within a relationship it's not just about sex intimacy covers lots of things doesn't it and that person said you know does it always have to be about sex and, and what about in intimacy um so in we often talk to people about encouraging them to spend more time together you know couple time socializing scheduling in a date night and lots of people do that because we're all you know everybody's busy mm. we all try to schedule in date nights yes. um which we know might lead to a sexual experience they might not but they may do um and that's kind of normal practice isn't it again on social media it, you know you can look up things about all oh, ideas for date nights so encouraging that intimacy between couples is is quite important and then looking at their intimate time and are they spending time talking sharing listening to each other communicating supporting each other emotionally and physically and that kind of fosters intimacy um and Leslie you were speaking to someone recently weren't you and they, they were having some issues as a couple and you said well do they do you kiss in the morning when you wake up do you kiss good night and those things had kind of disappeared oh as goodness. time goes on and you know, you're getting up, you're going to work, you're coming in, you're cooking the dinner, you're sorting stuff out. And those little intimate closeness things that happen within a relationship, they they kind of yeah. disappear. Um, so it's it's important to foster that intimacy outside of a sexual act. Mm. Even um, things like holding hands, yeah. even brushing someone's hair can be intimate and, you know, sharing time together. So yeah. it doesn't have to be the focus. It doesn't have to be sexual. Yeah. Going to the cinema. Yeah. Um, and it's important that people think about their own intimacy and sexuality as well. So we often speak to people about, you know, understanding the needs of their own body and how their body works you know, lots of people don't really know what their anatomy looks like or where their clitoris is. So, you know, get a mirror, lie on the bed, have a look. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, those, those, yeah, being more open with yourself and with your partners can really help. And also sh schedule some intimacy time, time on your own. So, you know, maybe a nice hot bubble bath um, or, uh, you know, scented candles, soft music, and, and and explore and experiment with yourself. Watch a bit of Bridgerton on the TV. Yeah. <laughs> Glass of bubbles. <laughs> yeah. But um, what about, we were talking about partners and quite often, you, you know, if you've been together for a long time, it might be trickier to, to, to things start flowing up. But what about when it's completely new? How mm -hmm. How do you approach some of these subjects? I think the thing to do there is to not to focus on the MS because mm -hmm. when you meet somebody anyway, it's really scary. It doesn't matter what age you are or, you know, who, who you're meeting. You meet someone, how much do you disclose? How much of yourself do you disclose? Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's not, it's not just about MS. So in those early days, be kind to yourself and, and just explore each other and, and get to know each other as people. And then, you know, you don't have to tell somebody you've got MS until you're ready, but you could you could tell them straight away. Everyone's different, aren't they? But it, you know, and um, and everyone. I think the thing to think about is everybody um, in the general population ha has issues about different things, and it is just about accepting yourself and loving yourself and finding a way of, of communicating that with your partner, whoever that is. Mm -hmm. If you're struggling with issues such as mobility and spasticity, are there any tools or equipment that you can get and where do you find them? I've heard things like pillows or wedges mm. and things like that. How, how, sounds a bit like building a pillow fort. But. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so um, there are lots of different um, wedges and pillows and positioning kits that you can get. And it's just a case of having a Google and see what, what you come across that's helpful. Um, it's difficult for us to kind of recommend mm. yeah. specific products, but often just make it simple to start with and just try with rolled up pillows. 
Mm. or um, not rolled up pillows, rolled up towels, or you could tie a pillow into a different position and experiment with what you've got at home. Yeah. Um, often with spasticity, um, it's triggered by movement in the lower limbs. So kind of moving into one particular position can trigger a spasm into extension where the leg would go out straight or flexion where the, the knee may contract or flex um, up. And it's about finding what triggers your spasticity and trying to do the, the opposite of that and position yourself to make that um, change. Um, and try to avoid lying with, with legs outstretched in missionary. That's That often causes more problems with extensor spasm. Putting the towel in the small of your back can just arch your back slightly. So again, just changing that trigger pattern um, and thinking about other triggers. So having a full bladder, having a full bowel, um, any other painful stimulus that might be going on, for example, you know, if you've got a cut on your finger or if you've got a headache or, you know, a, an ingrowing toenail, those things will make your spasticity worse temporarily. Um, and even things like heat or cold. So getting the temperature right, making sure there are no other noxious stimuluses going on within your body that are going to cause the spasms to be worse at a given particular time. Um, there's lots of different medications that can be prescribed to help manage spasticity. Again, there's often a, a bit of a trial and error situation that needs to be gone through to get the right medication. Um, and physiotherapists can be really helpful in helping looking at positioning. Um, we, we discuss that with physios, yeah. don't we? And they will often work with us and the patients to look at what positions are best. I got one question that came from Instagram that I'm slightly confused about, but maybe you can help me out. <laughs> How can you tell casual sex partners that you have an autoimmune disease and can only have protected sex without sounding like a boring patronizing nun? <laughs> oh, <laughs> for me, I, oh. I thought protective sex is obviously advisable when yeah, it's, you know, uh, casual partners and not because of MS, but to protect from, you know, diseases as, yeah, as STDs. Yeah. But are there any other reasons that why women with MS or, uh, shouldn't be having unprotected sex? Are they maybe talking about DMTs or, you know, pregnancy risk or? Well, I should think they're probably talking about all of it. So, I mean, like you said, Helena, we would recommend that people have, if they're having casual partners, definitely have protected sex. So, um, you know, to, to save yourself any risk of any um, STIs. Uh, the person could have been talking about the, the DMT. So, um, or they could have had a misunderstanding about what an autoimmune disease is. Obviously, having an autoimmune disease such as MS doesn't mean that you're increased risk of, of STIs. So that takes that out. Um, some of the disease modified therapies are immunosuppressants. So if you, you are uh, more prone to, to getting infections, but again, that, that shouldn't come from having unprotected sex as such. Um, but like you say, you don't want to fall pregnant, so you should have protected sex and you don't want to get an STI. That's that's the advice that we would be giving. Yeah, no, because the only other thing I would thought, if they thought that you can contract MS through sexual activities, but yeah, that's definitely yeah. a big no-no, yeah, yeah, isn't yeah, it? So. Yeah. <laughs> and the other thing is, if you're having casual sex, do you have to disclose that much of, of, of yourself to the to to the partner? Because it may be that they don't need to know that you have an autoimmune disease. Um, as long as you're keeping safe, that's the, the main thing. Mm. Yeah, and I don't think it makes you a boring patronizing nun. It doesn't make you a nun, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> <Definitely not. laughs> um, are there any other organizations that can sort of help with any sexual issues? Um, I mean, they could be both physical but it could be more the on the emotional plane like you know talking therapies or things like that so i mean talking therapies is a good place to start like we said we know that um having uh, sexual difficulties can increase um depression so you know if you're having relationship problems or experiencing emotional issues then you have to talk to talk therapies they can be a good place um there are many um of the uh, sexual health clinics now that have a, a psychosexual counseling um that, so they have uh, counseling that you can access 
uh, relate. They have sexual um, therapists. I think that can be quite expensive and not everybody, um, not every set town or city ha has access to relate or a sexual therapist. I, I mean, there are some um, different uh, websites as well where you can get some information. We'll pop some links in the, in the show yes, notes for yeah, this as yeah, well. Yeah. Uh, so my final question then would be, what's the sort of one takeaway advice that you would want to give for someone who's maybe thinking that, well, this isn't this isn't completely right, but I don't know what to do about it when it comes to it, sort of any type of sexual issues? I think the, the advice would be bite the bullet and ask. Don't yeah. be afraid to ask. We've we've heard it all before. Yeah. <laughs> um, People won't be embarrassed. They'll be pleased to point you in the right direction if they can't help you. And there is usually some advice um, and recommendation that you could be given to, to help. And we always see it as a compliment. If people feel that they can talk to us about their most intimate issues, then that means that they feel comfortable with us. So I think any healthcare professional, if you broach the subject, would, would, be, well, would welcome having that conversation with you. Mm. Brilliant. Thank you so much for this. It's been very interesting and um, yes, lovely to chat to you again. <laughs> oh, well, we'd like to thank you yeah. for inviting us. Yeah, thank you for asking us. Yeah, yeah. thank you. <laughs> oh, there was a lot of things to take in in both of those uh, interviews. Um, I have to say, I'm so pleased that we spoke to, well, or you spoke to, to Roxy. I've been following her on Instagram and I've been listening to her podcast, the Sick and Sickening podcast, which is well worth a listen. Um, I just think she's a, they are fabulous human being who can actually talk so very openly about things. Um, and, I, you know, sex is such a, such a difficult subject. Um, I sat in on, on a, a conference, Emma's Trust conference a few years ago. And I think, you know, Emma's Trust has been doing these sex books for men and for women uh, for, for several years. Um, I think, you know, they, they came out before I started at the MS Trust, and I've been here for, for a very long time. Um, but at this um, conference, um, there was uh, a, a doctor called uh, Dr. Susie L. Neal, who's very famous within her field, sort of about, especially about uh, female uh, sort of sexual problems and, and things. And she was saying to the MS nurses there that you do need to talk to your patients uh, about this and ask them, you know, when you go through all the sort of, you know, do you have any issues with this? How is your fatigue? What that, that almost a checklist and just always include the sexual stuff because there's so many people that don't want to bring it up because they just feel awkward about it. And she was also pointing out that we're getting a bit better to talk about bladder issues and bowel issues but because things are connected you know down there and if you have issues with your bladder there is a big chance that there is issues uh with your you know your genitalia and things as well so i think you know it's maybe if health professionals as well as you know, as people with MS get better at talking to it, because I think that was the thing. Roxy's so fantastically open about this. But there, like she pointed out, you know, there's a lot of introverted people that will struggle with it. And I would say myself, I'm not I'm quite extrovert as such, but I still find things like that a little bit embarrassing to talk about. And I think in all my uh, appointments that I've ever had with MS nurses, not once has anybody sort of brought it up or a neurologist. I've even been going to some bladder clinics and you'd think that maybe they would then ask if there's any issues around there, but I haven't had that either. Yeah, that's really surprising, especially, you know, when I spoke to Roxy, I found that surprising too, that, um, you know, they'd never been asked about um, sexual health or anything by an MS nurse or a health professional. As you say, Helena, you know, there's um, conversations around bladder and bowel, which people find sometimes equally difficult and awkward mm -hmm. to talk about, but that perhaps is like a segue into having the relation uh not relationships the sexual health chat with your health professional um I think we touched on it in my chat with Roxy where we talked about you know some people one of the concerns that they have with new partners is that bladder control when they're having sex mm -hmm. so maybe if that's something that you find a challenge maybe use that just like a discussion with your health professional around bladder control took a sort of segue into the sexual health chat but as you say Helena it kind of needs to be something that's improved on from both sides because mm -hmm. it can't be 
all on the person with MS to discuss, especially if you are that person that doesn't feel so comfortable having these conversations. And I think, you know, a lot of MS patients are very well informed that they read about a lot of symptoms and things like that. But you might not even know that those issues could be MS related. So you might just keep shtum about them, but actually they are MS related and there might be some medication that you're on that's causing, you know, that you lots of sensation or anything like that. And and it can actually be, you know, amended to 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 be to to work and I think it's it's definitely worth sort of having the conversation and the thing with health professionals is that they've already heard all sorts of things before and they they are not shy because otherwise they wouldn't be doing the job that they're doing yeah exactly I think that's something to bear in mind you know I I know personally I always feel a little bit awkward talking to health professionals about anything like well not anything but a lot of different things mm. and um the thing to that I always try and bear in mind is they have seen everything and a whole range of different uh, different versions on different people so you know that's what they're trained to do at the end of the day and if they didn't want to do it and they felt uncomfortable or awkward doing it they wouldn't have trained to do that job day in day out yeah no that's it and I think another thing to talk about was uh, talking to um, people that you're in a relationship with or who you're having you know a sexual relationship with Um, and we touched on this in the relationship uh, podcast as well but but I feel like you know it's all about communication and sort of telling things and it's it's often when it becomes an issue that's when people clam up and maybe you stop touching each other stop having sex just because it's um they don't want to talk about the weird the, the weird feelings that they're having or they feel guilty about not having sex because i think that's that's the thing it's like you need to society's kind of saying you need to do this you need to exercise you need to eat whatever it is five or seven portions of fruit and vegetable and you need to have sex this many times a week and you kind of look at that and you think but when <laughs> you know kids and job and work and things like that so actually what 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 um they both have all been saying about scheduling in things and actually thinking about it like that yes it might not be so spontaneous but but it's probably quite hard as you get older in life to be that spontaneous as well especially if you've got you know children and work to to juggle around it mm. um And of course, it's important to mention, you know, that sex isn't just how you interact with other people. It can also be about, you know, self-pleasure, but also how you feel about yourself and your body and making sure that that body confidence is there. You know, I think we've had quite a few decades now of, you know, seeing these fashion magazines or different advertising campaigns where we compare. It's well, We've also got reality TV as well, mm-hmm. um, but where you compare your bodies to different people. You know, just before we started recording, obviously, we were talking about when you see these things on Instagram of people saying, you know, don't wait until you've lost a certain amount of weight to go and enjoy yourself or live your life. Um so I think it's important to if you feel that you aren't being perhaps as positive about your body as you could be, maybe do some research, perhaps talk to a health professional um, see if you can turn that around a little bit. You know, it doesn't have to be that you get to the point of having the confidence that you would walk down the street in your underwear like some of these body positive campaigners yeah. would do. But it's just about like, you know, appreciating the body that you have and feeling confident or comfortable at least. Yeah. And I think, you know, social media has actually done a lot of bad, but it's also done a lot of good, especially with this body positivity, because I feel like we are seeing people of all kinds of sizes and, you know, with real bodies, not just these airbrush models that we, well, I mean, I'm much older than you, Emma, but but growing up in the sort of 90s, you had all these like really beautiful models and they were, that, that was sort of how people wanted to be seen. And you kind of would think, well, I certainly can never be seen as a sexy person unless I look like that and then I hope that now things are changing a bit you know you see see much more diversity on all fields you know it's not just these like white skinny (laughs) women that are the Mm. ideal of what you should be look like so I I think that that, that's brilliant Roxy was quoting uh, RuPaul there with uh, if you can't love yourself how the hell are you going to love anybody else and I think that's so true Uh, (laughs) I also you know speaking on the 90s the uh, there was a a group called En Vogue that did a song called free your mind and the rest will follow and I think a lot of it is just how you're feeling up there and when you have MS obviously there can be things that are messing it up for you up there um so therefore like to really kind of think about but you are still a fantastic person a sexual being and you know you you 
go for it and do what you want to do and it yeah like you said it's not just about having sex with a partner you could still be be done all by yourself with two people with many people if you're into that you know and I think we're not there to judge we just wanted to be working and helping you uh, in any way that we can with our information that we have um, and in the same way, if you can't get a hold of an MS nurse, we are happy to answer these questions as well at the, at the trust. And we've said it before that when we post about the information that we have on social media, we get not that many comments. Uh, we get some people sliding into our DMs asking about more information or sending an email, but there's not that much publicly commenting. And I think, you know, we don't have to do that. We should all get more relaxed talking about it. But uh, we're definitely here to answer any questions if you do have them. Um, yeah, so as Helena mentioned, if you have any questions about MS and life with the condition, whether that's related to sex or otherwise, the MS Trust is here to help support you. We're available to contact on our inquiry service between 9am and 5pm. That's Monday to Friday, excluding UK bank holidays. The number to contact is 0800 032 3839 or you're welcome to email ask at mstrust.org.uk and you can also find uh, the ms trust on facebook youtube twitter and instagram and you can as i said you can slide into our dms mm -hmm. there too um and you can find this podcast on spotify google and apple podcast and amazon music and on youtube uh, get in touch and like they say like and subscribe please let other people know about this podcast recommend it to people um we, we, we love to see uh, people talking about it and then see what's been useful, which episodes they like, uh, which what other topics we could talk about. So, so do get in touch. Oh, and before we go, um, the next podcast is going to be, as we mentioned at the start, on, on the topic of sex and men. Uh, but sadly, Emma is not going to be with me in that one because she's moving on to another job. And I just want to say a big, big, big thank you, Emma. You've been brilliant co-host and I will miss you so much. And good luck uh, in the future. Oh, thank you, Helena. Yeah, it's been amazing um, being on the MS Trust podcast and obviously I'll miss it a lot. But do keep listening to our future episodes. Obviously, I'm sure there'll be an amazing new host joining lovely Helena soon. Um, and we've got some really exciting topics lined up as well. So keep listening. I hope you will spread the word about our podcast too, wherever you go in the future. Of course. <laughs> Um, and finally, we would like to say a big thank you to Anne Chapman Audio for the music to this podcast. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.